Thank you. Um, yeah, welcome. Um, great to be here um, again. Uh, last year, I, I talked about Google Tango. And um, last year, um, AR Core was, um, yeah, was released just three days before the actual talk was. So I, I had to spend a whole weekend uh, getting up um, with all the, um, reading all the documentation and, and preparing the slides. Um, this, this year, is, there's a similar situation. Um, I will let you know why, or after this talk, you will know what I'm talking about. So first of all, let's um, set some expectations straight, because um, it's always a level of detail. And I know this is a developer conference, so you guys are really interested in the technical details. But um, in my experience, it's um, better to, to, to show you the, the um, the points where you um, are able to look things up yourself because the actual details, you will have to read the documentation, you will have to do the code labs, and I don't think it's such a good idea to, um, to, to show too much code because either um, it's so simple that you wouldn't have to tell, us at, uh, tell, tell the information or pass the information on as, as actual code, or it's so complicated that you cannot comprehend it in a, in, a, in, a, in a speed that, that's um, a good idea for, for a talk. So I will do no product presentation. I will do no code lab, e code lab either. Um, and there are a lot of excellent talks on AR Core and a lot of excellent documentation. If you really want to write an app, I will point you to the um, places where you can look everything up um, that you um, need to, to um, build an app. So, it's rather about collecting the information from different resources about AR and more specifically AR Core and all the tools that you actually um, can make use of to build an, a, a high quality AR app. So, also, let's, I will do a quick recap of the current state of AR devices in general. And, um, yeah, in short, outlook what AR might become in the future because AR is, in my opinion, more than just some cool gimmick to show, um, uh, to augment like product, um, uh, products or, or um, show cards on top of postcards. But that's the use case that you actually um, see most of the time, but in my opinion, there's more to it and uh, I will uh, try to explain why. Okay, this is the, the one slide that has uh, the most characters in the whole talk. Um, please forgive me this, but um, let's, we have to get a common understanding what uh, augmented reality is and what it's all about. So um, generally, the, the key points that you can take from th those definitions is that it's real time. Um, it combines many different senses, yeah? So vision, um, sound, maybe haptics. Um, and um, it's in real time, as I already said, it's interactive. So uh, even though the football game is a great example, there are a lot of effects that are kind of AR, yeah? But they're not in real time and they're not interactive, and that's the difference. Um, and it's registered in 3D. So these are um, two definitions. One is from uh, Wikipedia, one is from Ronald Azuma, who did an excellent, excellent um, survey of augmented reality in 1997. And this is the next thing I want to point out. Um, in this talk, oh no, there, uh, he also did a, did a great talk uh, where the types of AR systems um, can be separated, or, or where he um, grouped the, the, the AR systems into different um, yeah, display types. So one thing, like for example, the HoloLens is an optical see-through system. So um, in uh, contrast to a video see-through system, which AR Core, um, how AR, AR Core works on the smartphone. So you have a camera, you have a display, and uh, the augmentations um, are on the display. So in, in the HoloLens, it's um, done in an optical system, and um, these these two um, this, or, um, differences might be technical, um, but in fact, there is another form of AR that is thinkable, and there are prototypes for that. It's projective AR, so you don't even need a device that you wear, or no glasses, no smartphone. It's just pro projected in your surroundings. And this is a concept that's not a hype. 
It has been around since the first tool that, that man has created. You need a light source, uh, then you can cast shadows, and there's, there are techniques to tell stories with shadows and to transport information with that. So it's a real, it's an old topic. It's nothing, just, just a hype. Um, the basics of that are real, go way deeper. If you try to find the first AR device, um, as such as technology, you could uh, go back to mechanical solutions like the kaleidoscope or, or, um, or the pocket watch with, with, a, uh, with a music box in, in, inside. So if you take the term AR a bit more general, these are augmenting the world with more information or with um, optical effects. The next step would be um, like the cinematograph or um, the tinfoil phono phonograph, so the, the ways to project images or to record and replay sound are part of this whole um, evolution um, that took us where we are now. Um, if we move on a bit more quickly, these are the first yeah, head-mounted displays or headphones. Yeah? So this is from the uh, 1880s, and this, this box approximately uh, weighs 10 pounds. So this is uh, the, the way um, um, the first telephone connectors were working. So they had this loudspeaker on their shoulder in a harness. <laughs> so, um, and the first head-mounted dis uh, display, um, which is only related to IR, I know, but it's an interesting fact to know, um, was called the Sword of Damocles because of, of its massive uh, um, uh, dimensions and weight. So um, you can see it here. The first um, device that really um, comes close to what AR is, is all about was uh, developed by Rosenberg in 1992 um, for the US Air Force. And this was more like an experiment, so it wasn't an actual device. Um, and it, um, there's a setup with a robotic arm that you can see here. And um, you have a, a board where you had to um, yeah, complete specific actions, and the experiment was does this optical guidance that it's augmented upon the scene help the people to, um, to do the task more efficiently um, and more precisely? And um, this was uh, the first mention of uh, AR as such. Um, and what you see here is the first working AR device that um, uh, Ronald Azuma built for his dissertation, or uh, at least it's referenced in the dissertation video. And what you can see here, it's in 3D, and it's basically these um, lines are aligned with the, with the object, the real object. Okay, we will come to mobile AR, I promise. Just a quick, um, quick um, recap, recap of the uh, current uh, state of the art in 2018. There are AR glasses, um, but those are more like, um, they're too expensive for consumers and they're not really um, socially acceptable and still prototypes. So there's a lot of uh, technical uh, things to tackle and uh, technical um, 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 yeah, th things that have, uh, problems that have to be solved. Um, Okay, what in the future, there's this, uh, there, there are references in, 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 in movies like, or in um, like um, Altered Carbon, where you have um, a, an, uh, um, a, a contact lens that actually augments um, everything. And there are experiments going on to make use of contact lenses, um, but not as uh, AR devices at the moment. So that what you see here is Google's patent on, um, on a glucose meter. So, um, and these are actually um, prototypes that have an optical display, like 16 times 16 um, LEDs, and um, there's an experiment that um, um, to, to, um, by, by uh, Parvitz um, that tried how, these, um, how long these could be uh, wor yeah, worn, yeah. So, Let's, as such, mobile devices are not the, um, the ideal interface for creating AR experiences because um, it's clumsy. You have a very restricted field of view. Um, you do not have your hands free. Um, it gets strenuous after some time. So if you have an experience that takes on for maybe like half an hour, um, you're tired after that, and you need space. You cannot really freely move around, and it's um, not ideal. 
still, there are enough reasons um, to actually um, still do it, still create um, augmented reality experiences. Why? Because we have an ecosystem. People are used to pay money for digital content on Google Play um, or all the mobile OSs, whatever. Um, and you actually, today, you can reach mil billions of users um, when you create an AR app. So another thing is, why is smartphone ideal um, as an intermediate technology to create our AR experiences? Because basically, all the basic uh, parts are there. So you have a display, you have a camera, you have enough computing power, you have sensors like uh, IMUs, the inertial measurement unit, you have a touch screen. Um, and you have localization hardware, which might be uh, interesting for use cases where it's not like table-sized or room-sized experiences, but um, you can move around in the world. I just wanted to point you um, to uh, a, a, um, a wrap-up paper about the history of mobile augmented reality, because this actually goes way back. It's not something that has come up last year. Um, and I, the, the key points in this slide is, that it's not, it hasn't been a long time since the first phone that had GPS built in was released, and the first camera phone even. It's like 18 years ago, the first phone with a camera was released. And this is, um, yeah, so if you're interested in the history, just uh, uh, look that up. I'll, um, I will hand out the slides later on. Okay, if we look at the uh, software side of things, there have been a lot of solutions around. Um, I don't want to go into detail on each one of them, but we are going to focus on AR Core. Uh, by the way, this isn't even complete. Amazon and Facebook have their own solutions too. OK, so a quick intro. Who of you has heard of AR Core? OK, many of you. Who has actually tried it or, or built a sample project? OK. Um, it's available for. Um, a couple of platforms. It's not only um, native Java or Kotlin development. You can um, use it with the NDK as well. You can use it in Unity and Unreal and even for the web. And with the new features uh, that were announced at Google I.O., there is even a, a way to use it cross-platform with iOS. So you can have cross-platform experiences, um, but I'll uh, tell you more about that later. So what's new? Um, as I said, it's a similar situation like last time. Um, this time, there were two new features um, um, announced. So we heard a talk about Scene Forum uh, yesterday. So um, this is one feature that's really uh, important and has been. We've been. We have developers as developers have been waiting for. Um, and um, there's two new features which are called augmented images and uh, cloud anchors, um, which I'm just going to quickly um, discuss. Just you know what it's all about, um, and have some some knowledge how you could create an app um, with those. For the details, please look it up. Um, let's start. So these two features. This is the this is the one thing, and but. Tooling has really in, um, improved or since, since I.O. I mean, there were alone seven talks on, um, on Google I.O. this year about AR that introduced or, or um, had, were, were, in the broad sense, uh, relevant for, for AR core. Um, and apart from that, I collected some, some tooling that you um, really should know if you want to create an IR app. One is SceneForm that we already talked about. You have Android Studio in the integration for SceneForm uh, that you see here. Um, and you um, actually can edit things too. So what I did here, this spaceship wasn't metallic before. Uh, I just switched it to be metallic and it updated like in a couple of seconds. And you actually can work with that. And this is something that we didn't have uh, on, on for, for Tango devices or for AR core so far. Um, ah, just a quick wrap up where um, I will talk about the, these in detail. So there's um, Japid, which is for debugging, um, which may, might be interesting for you even if you are not doing an AR app, but a 3D OpenGL um, you know, app. 
And of course, there's audio, uh, because uh, ideally AR is multi-sensorial, so it's not only about vision, it's about sound too. And there's a, a toolkit called uh, Resonance Audio that is uh, basically was intended for the Daydream apps or, or cardboard apps that, could, that you can use with AR Core 2. And um, last thing is Poly, which is um, um, a place where you can uh, get your um, 3D models and uh, that are able that, uh, that you are able to import in, into scene form. Okay, so as I said, uh, as I already told you, there's, there were seven talks that were relevant to AR. I just wanted to list them as a short um, thing um, that that might be useful uh, for everybody who looks at the slides uh, after this talk. Um, so basically, you can find them in, in the Google I/O playlist as well. Um, but there are a lot of uh, best practices and um, yeah, a lot of information that you um, would, hi would have to find out the hard way if you just try it out yourselves. Because, I mean, um, Google uh, can spend the resources to iterate in design sprints or in, in, um, to evaluate the, the um, uh, user experience. Um, and this is, uh, every, these are lessons that you don't have to learn yourself, but you can um, make use of the best, best practices. Okay, let's quickly walk through the feature set of AR Core. The basic thing is, if you want to present something in AR, that means um, it blends into the real environment um, optically, the, f the, um, the hardest or one of the, the key problems is that you have to track the device's motion in, in space. And um, this happens not only with the sensors, the IMU, um, is, of course, um, a key point or a key technology that, uh, that you need for that, but it has its problems too. So sensors um, produce even the, are not ideal. So they produce error, and if you have high frame rates, like 100 hertz, um, then these er errors add, add up, and this is something, uh, a concept called drift. Um, so this, is, this happens if um, you um, look and you uh, try out an AR app, and things start to float away. This is um, something that can be corrected for by the user's environment. As you see here, this is taken from the Google documentation. So um, there are key points here that help to stabilize against this sensor drift. So otherwise, the device wouldn't know, OK, I'm a, am I still moving? The sensor tells me, yes, I'm moving. But the image doesn't change, so it can be corrected. So just to get some terms right, when I'm talking about poses or, or, or a pose, um, or the, the, uh, the, the documentation reference poses. Um, this is meant. So it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's the device position in space, um, which is three um, transitional um, um, uh, components and uh, three rotational. So um, this, as such, makes up a pose in IR core. So if you look at the key feature that we were talking about is motion tracking, and this is basically from the um, Tango. Uh, it's an app that was shipped with Tango devices, but you can see what it's about and what the precision is. Just to give you an impression, if you use other technology like beacons or Wi-Fi um, to, to track position, it's not as, um, I mean, this circle has about, it's about, I don't know, four meters. So it's basically standing up from the table and just walking around the table and sitting down. That's what you see. Um, but as you, as you have seen, it's really smooth. So you have 100 hertz. And if you use beacons, you get updates twice a second. Um, and these uh, position varies between how much effort you're putting into stabilization between maybe half a meter or two meters. So this is something completely different, right? Um, the second feature is environment understanding. So um, from the movement or, or the, the differences in the camera image, um, AR Core is able to uh, detect surfaces uh, in the, um, in the uh, environment. So, um, and if you have a look into how it actually looks in the apps, um, these dots, they indicate that uh, a surface has been detected. And um, another term that might be uh, interesting is anchor. Anchor is a combination of a pose and the um, actual point cloud or feature, a set of features that, um, that connects it to the real world. Yeah? So this plane, you can anchor it to the real position, and um, that's why you, um, th that's the, 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 the concept of anchors. In order to, uh, so, so that the um, augmentations look realistic, um, 
you cannot just paint them as is, but they have to be lit in the same way that the, that the scene is lit. Because if you're in a, in a, um, in a very bright space, um, then your augmentations won't look right. But even, even worse, when um, the lightning is, is pretty low, um, things will just seem to glow from inside if they're not uh, correctly lit. And this just breaks the immersion. You even can, um, you even can react to uh, changes in the, in the um, light, lightning. Uh, maybe uh, you have seen the example with um, the Wizard of Oz, Oz the, the lion, that uh, starts to get afraid when you turn off the light. So this is basically, you can use lighting as a trigger as well. So a new feature that was introduced is called augmented images, and this is something um, that's actually been around for quite a while. So if you used any of Metayo, Wikitude, Vuforia, um, or any of these AR platforms, this is something that they were able to do like years ago. Um, and this feature has been put into um, AR core. So basically what it does it, is it recognizes an image and then uses this as a reference point so you can place your uh, augmentations. Um, and there are a couple of use cases. So this is like the basic thing. You have a postcard and you show uh, a model of a product on it. You know, or you have a, a, a product box and uh, when you scan it with your phone, uh, the, the, the model, the actual toy that's in there starts uh, fly, flying around, whatever. Huh? The second thing, which is, in my, from my perspective, more interesting, is like is called cloud anchors. And I just explained to you what anchors mean. Anchor um, help to fi um, connect the real environment with the uh, with the virtual environment, and they can be shared across devices. This is something that's new, and this is um, something that's really important because you don't want, um, because you, you now are able to create multi-user experiences that work across devices and even uh, across Android and iOS. So this basically, technically it, it works um, in a way that when you have detected uh, a plane um, or the environment with uh, device A, um, you can host it and upload a small portion of the features and, and the, the position um, uh, to, to the Google Cloud. And then on the second device that wants to join the experience, you can call Resolve, uh, and you get an ID that you have to pass around by, by your own service or by, by your own um, backend infrastructure. And then when uh, the, the client device or the, the second device B um, calls res Resolve that ID and then can join in the same experience. Okay, I um, talked about tools. Um, as I said, it, the, the tool, tooling has dramatically improved. Um, that's mostly to the fact that you have SceneForm and the, that you have um, Android emulator uh, integration. So you don't need an AR core enabled device because you saw that the, the device list is getting longer and longer, but still you might not have one of those. So if you want to develop, you can also do this on the emula emulator now. So this is how it looks. So it's like a first-person game. You can uh, just uh, move around. Um, and um, this is like the, 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 the Android Studio plugin for um, SceneForm that I uh, already, already told you about. So SceneForm is like a uh, 3, 3D engine. Um, and this is something that has been missing for uh, uh, a long time. Uh, we, were, we started develop, developing for AR when it's uh, with Tango devices, and we had to rely on some open source uh, solutions like Rajavali, which were uh, badly maintained and uh, buggy. And this really, um, the other uh, thing, uh, the other possibility would have been to really write uh, OpenGL code, which is really technical and doesn't help if you want to create. Um, yeah, so it's, it's useful to have a different level of abstraction for that. So, the cool thing about SceneForm is it, um, it's, it helps uh, in a way that you don't have to uh, do the hard math. Yeah? So, 3D math might be uh, or can become very tricky, especially if you have different coordinate systems that you have to, um, um, to convert from and to. Um, and especially if you think of a solar system, the sun is in the middle, and you have a planet, and you have a moon of the planet, the task to calculate the um, rotation path of the moon 
can get tricky, and this is something that um, uh, that scene form um, can can help you with. So you just um, um, can calculate um, the the animation in regard to each other. But the more more uh, from my point, even more interesting part is that you can actually use Android standard UI elements um, and put them in a uh, in a 3D world. So these these are uh, layout files like you know them from from Android development. Yeah, and you can just place them somewhere. And this is one of the reasons um, why I I think this. Uh, this is very useful. Yeah? So you can, with the tools you already know, create new experiences. Um, and you will have new problems that you haven't known before because it's volumetric designs. So things are, can be in front of each other. Um, and things uh, can be placed in a 3D, 3D place. OK, another thing uh, that you uh, yesterday mentioned was poly, uh, and that's another thing that was really tedious, like importing 3D objects into, uh, into um, an engine, uh, or something like Rajavali, or reading them for OpenGL, can be tedious and error-prone, and this is something um, that has been improved, so you can Im import uh, 3D objects into scene form, and it l does all the heavy lifting. And with Poly, you have uh, a website um, uh, where you can actually search for publicly available models and just download them and um, in, in a couple of minutes import them to your project. Because not every Android developer is automatically a 3D artist, right? OK. Um, I said it's multi-sensorial. Um, so game developers have long noticed that for to create a, a feel of immersion, audio is even as important um, as, as, uh, as the, the visual um, um, part of your app or, or your game. So uh, if you use resonance audio, you can place, um, of course, the basic, basic thing is that you can place sound sources somewhere in the environment. And they actually, um, yeah, if you listen to it, it really um, sounds as if they're an, as, if they, if they move correctly, but there are more advanced concepts like um, you have occlusion, so what is if the sound source is uh, behind a tree? Um, it will sound different, yeah? Or um, not, um, sound sources are directed. So um, if you think of a trumpet, the main uh, the sound is coming out of the trumpet, and if you listen to it from the side, it sounds different, just as, a, um, as an example. Okay, one thing that for you as a developer is really important is like debugging, because um, if you're not the total OpenGL um, mastermind um, and you already know what's wrong about the calls that, that you're making, or um, this uh, is something that you definitely have to be able to inspect. And this is something that you can use Jabit for. So with Jabit, you can. Um, you can really look into every detail of your of the of the of the draw steps um, and um, look at all the um, all the objects and um, the the materials and the textures and you can step through this and see what's actually happening. This helps to um, yeah to identify problems um, like overdraw. So another thing that's changed is. As I already mentioned, there were so many talks with a lot of information that is important not only for you as developers, but for the UX part of the team as well. So you, have, you cannot just apply all the knowledge that you have uh, built up by creating 2D apps for an AR app. So one thing is don't litter um, these, um, the, the, the screen with buttons, because this will take up so much parts of the screen that you actually cannot really see the AR experience anymore. Yeah? So uh, things that should be on the surface of the screen are only really, really primary actions. Yeah? This is just one takeaway. Uh, in fact, there are separate talks about this topic, and there, there were some, um, something called the, the, the pillars for AR design, which include the user's environment. You can use multiple surfaces. You have to think of the user's movement, the user's scale, so users can be big, can be small. Um, what um, about how do you initialize the, the, the user into AR? How, you, how do you in, interact with objects? And not la, uh, last but not least, how do you um, the, the volumetric interface design? Huh? 
Okay, if you create an AR app, um, the technical part and the UX is not everything you have to think about, but you need to think about what is the actual product value of my, of my app. So this is something that you actually can buy. Um, but um, for, uh, there was, there was, uh, there's one quote that I want to make. It's uh, that your app has to create a meaningful connection of, between the real and the virtual world, which is the quote is by uh, Ronald Azuma that I quoted earlier as well. Um, but this is important. So if you just uh, use AR as a, as a gimmick, the effect will wear off pretty soon. People will just download it, try it once, and uh, deinstall it. So you have to think about what is actually helping the user, and how do, I, do I connect, how do I connect the real world to the virtual world? OK, um, there are different types of AR um, applications um, that I uh, earlier mentioned, like you have table-sized table experiences uh, where you put maybe a toy or a virtual environment on the table or objects, um, or then there are room scale experiences like a game where um, um, yeah, or, or where uh, I can augment virtual um, things uh, into a room scale environment, or there's something like the often quoted Pokemon Go where it's, the augmentations are everywhere, can be everywhere on the planet. Um, if you really want to connect the virtual world to the real world, um, localization is one key thing that you have to take care about. So, and GPS is one thing, you have like five meters precision, which is not enough for AR, because um, depending on where you are, five meters make the difference whether you are inside a building or um, you're on the street or beside the street, so this has real impact. That's why um, an omnipresent um, positioning system, system with high precision and high frame rate is really needed um, in order to make uh, world scale um, um, AR apps feasible. Another thing that Google just started creating with these multi-device experiences is called the AR cloud. And there are separate talks of, um, on, on that as well that I can, um, yeah, you, that are really interesting. So, and this is basically, you need a virtual representation of the real world when you want to uh, put uh, augmentations uh, everywhere across uh, the globe. And that's, you need an instant ub ubiquitous localizer, that's what I uh, just mentioned, and you need some kind of scalable, shareable point cloud. And um, the question is, how is that created? There are different um, uh, approaches to that, but uh, we'll see uh, wh what actually works. And and you need real-time multi-user interaction. And this is something that's just a new feature that, that has come out, so we can start to really cooperate in these augmented worlds and work together on digital objects. Um, and this is not only for games interesting, it could be, you could um, work on a, uh, as an architect, work together on a 3D object that's projected on your, on your, on your table, and you could share this experience with coworkers and, uh, and contribute to the same, same object. Okay. Um, if you think, I mean, this slide looks a bit like uh, you, you take all the hype topics of the last two years and put them on one slide. I know, sorry for that. But it's about the context that you have to think about. If you have a real good AR device, and I'm not talking about smartphones, I'm not talking about maybe not talking about glasses, what might be the next step, um, that you can use um, and that's socially acceptable and doesn't make you look like the king of nerds. Um, then these, all these areas could work together to create like a paradigm shift to a new kind of um, user interface. Yeah? So if you think computer vision, things like the Google Lens, object recognition, um, face recognition, um, all these things put together uh, really make, um, make, uh, make up new, new worlds of, of, uh, of possibilities. And I think the last thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you is um, one research paper, or it's a site um, for computer vision and pattern recognition. So this is a research topic at the moment, um, in 2017. And this is what you can do. You can, if you take an image, 
um, you can automatically analyze things like create. This is a, there's a, the face of a horse, and there's a mountain behind a horse, and there's a man wearing a shirt, wearing a shirt, riding a horse. So, and you can extract these kind of um, inf these kind of graphs of information just from images. And if you put things together, you, ca you might have AR glasses that really understand the user context and are able to um, create experiences that really um, fit to what the user has to know. So you, you can show the information that the user actually in his context requires at the place where it's actually needed and not on a device, but in the real world. One great example that, um, that is cited in one of the Google I.O. talks is um, you just open your phone, and if you say you want to learn French, um, you just do object recognition on everything that's around you. So um, you can, um, and you detect the object and show the French translation at the object. So, and then this, this is something that's actually a prototype that, that, that's actually working. And if you start to think like that, a whole new uh, um, world of uh, possibility evolves. And um, yeah, I, I think this is far more than just um, putting a, project on the, uh, a product on the table. So that's what I was uh, referring to. If you really put this in context and um, think about all the connections to the different um, uh, types of area, or the different areas where we're actually um, making huge progress, um, this really gets, uh, well, it gets clear that it's an exciting time to do an AR application, and you can um, really think of really new things that haven't been there before. Thanks for listening. So we still have a couple of minutes. If some of you has questions, there are, as always, the microphone at the side of the stage, and I can come with my microphone in the front. Yeah, just one question. The image recognition, is this also only for the supported devices, because I would think that the calibration isn't that necessary for this kind of stuff, or do you have anything? What, what do you mean by image recognition? You mean augmented images? No, not augmented images, but the postcard where you put a line on it or something. That's yeah, that's, that's augmented images. So you, ah, okay, you, yeah, okay, you, you, create a, you can um, create yeah, exactly. a database up to 1,000 images okay. and track up to 20 of those um, in, in, in real time and then use them as a re reference frame for putting yeah. objects. And this works on, on uh, devices that support AR core, yeah. So not all devices, only the supported also because... Yeah, but actually they're, they're, the list is really growing, so yeah. I can go back to that slide um, if you're interested in the details. You can look it up as well. But, I um, oh no, there was. So this is basically a lot. I mean, um, this is, I think, the last time I do an AR core <coughs> talk that I'll really put all up all the devices because nobody actually reads that. Uh, and of course, I added the Apple devices because now you can uh, interact with AR kit. Um, but I mean, many Samsung phones are there and they make a big market share. Um, Huawei phones are there. And this, okay, it will take time. Of course, legacy users with legacy phones might not be able to use it. That's, that's true. So you still have a limited user uh, target uh, um, a target audience, but um, this will evolve over time too. Okay, thanks. Uh, can I ask about the devices which are not supported? What do you think? But why, why would why would some device not be supported if it's released this year? I mean, what uh, what I, kind of an issue of hardware? Because there, there is not a single tablet on this list; only hmm. phones. Yeah. If, you have, if you do something for business, you have tablets a lot and... Yeah, I mean, I think there are two reasons. One uh, is performance. So that might be, if it's a new device, uh, it might not be an issue. But there are, there are kinds of devices that just are not supported because they cannot uh, yeah, keep up the computing to, to actually calculate the positioning and, and detection. Um, the second one is that you really have to have specific knowledge about the device um, 
um, the device configuration. So where is the IMU placed in respect to the camera? Yeah, because this influences the, the movement and the detection. So what's the focal, uh, the, the, um, the focal point of the, of the camera? So what's the, the, the characteristics of the lenses that are in there? Um, so this is why, for example, Apple has way better a, a, a head start because they know every detail of the, the hardware that's in the devices. And this is something you have to calibrate those devices. Yeah, so there's a conflict. be on the side of the maker? Yes, yeah, so they they, that's, a, that's why I guess Google is just. Uh, um, why is Google doing that? I mean. <laughs> no, I, I don't think they, they do. Um, they just partner up with, uh, with um, device manufacturers and of course, they want, want you to buy the new devices, so I guess they will add this as a feature for the new ones. Apart from the performance issue, that might be a case too. So, but I, I, actually, I don't know. But these are two reasons why uh, a device couldn't, uh, uh, um, might not be supported. Thanks. So we are out of time right now, but I think if you still have a question, you can still ask still after the talk. And have a nice continuation. Enjoy the match if you like football. But don't forget to attend the last talk and enjoy the con have a nice continuation of the conference and make a huge applause for Chill again because it's quite late and it's tiring. And there's the game playing and he likes that. <laughs>